Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Medical Fitness Podcast. I'm Jeff Young, and I'm joined in this episode by my co-host, Dr. Thomas Hammond. Our podcast is brought to you by the Medicine Rehab and Fitness Institute and JY Kinesiology LLC, both of which are dedicated to medical fitness education and building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness. You can learn more at mrfinstitute.org. Our purpose is to provide you with principal and evidence-based content on all things related to exercise science, strength and conditioning, medical fitness, and building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness. Our next guest is someone we're fortunate to know and collaborate with, Mike Stack. Mike wears a lot of not just hats, but very successful hats in his professional life. As a lecturer at the University of Michigan in their School of Kinesiology, a business owner and entrepreneur, and as someone who's doing amazing things at the national and local levels in connecting healthcare and fitness. He touches on a lot of these things during our interview in the form of one practical takeaway after another that anyone listening can learn from. From building brands, developing successful careers, and how we as clinicians and fitness professionals can and should better collaborate and advance our fields. Mike taps into his wisdom and experience to give a ton of great advice. So enjoy episode number two of our medical fitness podcast. All right, I am extremely excited to welcome two people to the podcast series. First, our special guest, Mike Stack, who's a friend, colleague, soon to be co-presenter at the American College of Lifestyle Man Medicine's annual conference this upcoming fall. Welcome, Mike, and it's awesome to have you as a guest on our show. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. I, I, I take it as an honor. To, I know you had Amy Bantham on already, and I have a lot of respect for Amy. And so just super excited to have this conversation uh, you know, with you uh, after you know knowing you for so long. I'm really excited you got the podcast going because I think you're going to contribute a lot of very valuable things to the industry. And the other person I want to um, welcome is my co-host and uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Thomas Hammett, who I've been collaborating with for a little over two years now. And Thomas, I'm extremely glad to have you as a co-host. Yeah, I'm psyched to be here, guys. We uh, we span like three different time zones on this call right now, which is pretty cool. Um, Jeff, as you said, we met, has it really been two years? I think it's that's, been a little uh, over two years. That's wild. And Mike, you and I met pretty close to that same timeline as well, I think, yeah. almost almost two years ago. Um, I'm just really excited to be here with both you guys and co-hosting with you, Jeff. It's an honor. Yeah. So just so the viewers and listeners have a little bit of a background, um, if I and Mike, you correct me wherever I'm wrong, but we met um, when you kind of first started your podcast, just a few episodes into it back in about 2020 in the, you know, the depths of, of COVID and the pandemic, right? Yeah. Yep. And, and, and since that time, uh, you know, we've, we're kind of flipping the script here because you've had me on the, the podcast a couple of times. Thomas has been on it. We've collaborated with some other things. And I've, really, as we've gotten to know each other, um, it's become extremely obvious that we really share the same passion like across the board, which is amazing. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so so glad to have met you and 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 seen your journey, which you're getting ready to talk about um, with your podcast and actually in your career, at least over these last two or three years in general. So with that said, what I'd really like you to do is I pass the baton over to you is talk about what you your passion for what you call the wellness paradox and the uh, the name of your podcast, um, what it led it to being a passion. Um, what led to the creation of your podcast, the experience of hosting it, and what you learned from it, because you've had amazing guests on your show, just one after another, and how it shaped or evolved you professionally. So those are the things I would love to talk about. And with that said, take over and give us your background, your story, and we'll go from there. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I'll give the Cliff Notes version of a lot of stuff until we get up to the podcast. But, you know, I, I was somebody in high school who was a real, very overweight kid, and I was picked on for being overweight in high school. And I found this little YMCA gym in Westland, Michigan, which even if you're from Michigan, you might not know where Westland, Michigan is. And uh, this gym was probably, I don't know, no bigger than like a very small 
physical therapy clinic or maybe a big hotel gym. Like it was by any stretch of the imagination, not a very physically impressive spot. But that was the first place that I ever felt like I belonged socially. Like when I was in school, I was picked on. It was kind of like socially uncomfortable for me. But that gym, I could just, I could just be me. And I really didn't realize it at 16, 17, 18 years old, because you don't at that point in life. But that experience would shape the rest of my professional career. And so I started working as a personal trainer. I worked at Bally Total Fitness. Uh, Jeff, you're you're old enough to remember Bally's. Thomas, Thomas may not be old enough to remember Bally's, but it's the predecessor to LA Fitness. And, you know, that environment was great on a lot of levels, but it wasn't that same inclusive culture and community that I had at that YMCA that I felt so strongly about. So that caused me to start my own business in 2007, a, a boutique commercial fitness business, which you know I enjoyed quite a bit. And you know we grew pre-pandemic to three locations with about 4,000 clients and 80 employees. And then the mm -hmm. pandemic got here. Yeah, it was a great experience. And the pandemic got here and Obviously, you know, here in the state of Michigan, you know, we hit the pause button. And, you know, I think for the most part, where both of you guys are, are at, you know, on both the coasts, you guys hit the pause buttons too in, in both of your states. So I wasn't alone. But what it got me to do for the first time in, in really over 12, 13 years, it actually got me to really evaluate where we were at and what was important to me. And what I realized was that as we became more of a boutique commercial fitness business, we were less inclusive and less accessible than what we were previously. And I asked myself, what is the best way to become more accessible? And, and I've always worked kind of on the fringes of the medical fitness realm, like in the commercial fitness realm, but in the medical fitness realm, had relationships with PTs and doctors. And I finally said during COVID, you know, it's time to double down on this and it's time to actually go in this direction. So it was at that point where I decided, you know, really not that, not that far after we met Jeff, probably, you know, that fall of, of 2020 or, you know, early part of 2021, that we were going to close down two of our locations and we were going to focus on pivoting our uh, original location, our Ann Arbor location to a medical fitness center, integrating in with one of the local health systems and that really got me to start to say, okay, what is the what is the best way to stand up a successful, profitable, and impactful medical fitness business? It, so it actually generated more questions than answers. And I realized one of the best ways to get the answers to the questions I wanted was to talk to the best and brightest minds in our field. And here's the big secret I have for both of you guys, and you may look differently at your podcast episodes now that I'm going to say this, but Good. I knew I knew that if I had to pay for sitting down and talking to the best and brightest minds in our field, I was going to run out of money really fast. So if I started a podcast where I could promote what the best and brightest minds in our fields think and do, I could learn from them. So the podcast initially, yeah, the podcast initially for me, and I hope this is exactly what it turns into for you guys, is it was just my my big kind of vexing question of why fitness and healthcare are so disconnected. I mean, that's that's the premise of the wellness paradox. The paradox is we have all this great ability as fitness and wellness professionals to make people healthy, yet we're not talking to the people that are directly working with those who are in ill health and need our help. So how do we bridge that gap? And I said, that's a massive problem. So that's what got me to start the podcast was just, I wanted to talk to a bunch of brilliant people. No one wants to talk to me unless I pay them for it. So I basically said, all right, I need to talk to people. And even if they would talk to me on my podcast, it'd be even better if they would talk to the University of Michigan on a podcast. So I went to the people at the School of Kinesiology and the development people, in fact, the people that are responsible for raising funds for the school. And I said, I have an idea that will help create content that we can market the program with and help us improve our, our prominence in the exercise science community. Are you interested? And of course, they said yes. So that's where the wellness paradox was born. It was out of my need and desire to talk to very, very bright people like both of you guys. And out of the fact that I was able to um, strategically position myself with the School of Kinesiology to backstop my podcast with the U of M brand. So that is a long way of saying this is a, a networking and educational tool for me.
that is turned into informational content for professionals in our industry. So it's a win-win. Absolutely ingenious, man. And you and you thought about all this yourself and, and weren't tapping into anyone's minds? All these ideas oh, I'm came always, Yeah, I'm always tapping into people's minds. Like, you know, I, I believe me, like there's, I stand on the shoulders of giants. The one person that really pushed me on this, uh, and it's, you actually know him, Jeff, because I introduced you at one point, is my former marketing director, Nate Langley. You know, Nate was, Nate was really insistent on, you know, Mike, this is your way to network. This is your way to gain knowledge and information. And this is your way to, to put yourself and your cause on the map. And I really kind of, uh, I had a lot of ambivalence around it initially, largely because I was like, oh man, like I see the people that do podcasts. I couldn't do a podcast, right? I'm sure it was the same thing that you guys thought, exactly. you know, with, with, yeah. yeah, although, although you, you saw me do it and you're probably like, well, if that Yahoo Mike can do it, I know I can, <laughs> but, but, it, but in all seriousness, like I really wasn't sure if, if I did it, if anybody would listen, right? And then I realized and it didn't matter if anybody listened or not. What mattered is I was putting the content out there. I was trying to add value. I wasn't charging for it. And I was learning and ultimately I ended up being a great thing. So I, I think, you know, Nate was really the one that, that pushed me and I owe him a lot of credit for me getting to the point, but, you know, also the school of kinesiology really stepped up and they had trust and faith in me that I would be a good steward of their brand without a lot of, um, legal consternation uh like i mean there was i didn't talk to lawyers or have to sign any agreements i hope saying this on your podcast now doesn't get me to have to talk to lawyers oh, but uh, <laughs> but but yeah no in all seriousness it was uh you know nate nate's influence and then look i got a lot of great guests right off the bat because i was affiliated with u of m and the momentum built and you know it just it kind of is a, a virtuous cycle now. And I mean, you guys are going to find that as this gets going and you get more guests, it's, oh yeah, that person, sure, I'll do it. Oh, you have those couple people, sure, I'll right. do it. So it just it gains momentum. So, you know, Mike, I think one of the things, even as being a guest on your podcast that really stood out to me before I was on your show was such a clear, you had such a clear sense of vision and purpose for putting that together. And you kind of just spoke about that and where that came from. It was great to hear that for me. You know, you kind of share that story on your podcast, but to me today, you almost shared it in a different way mm -hmm. um, by sharing about the initial business that you started and feeling like that was less inclusive or accessible. Um, and I'd love if you could just expand on that a little bit and tell us what you mean. And uh, maybe just for the common listener who wouldn't know kind of what, what that looks like. Yeah, that's, the, that's a great question, Thomas. So, I, I mean, I look at it on two levels. You know, let's first, you know, talk ob objectively on the economic level. Like in the boutique fitness business, you are competing with the biggest franchise players, uh, Orange Theory, Fit Body Boot Camp, I mean, Solid Core, the list goes on and on and on and on, right? And I'll give you a perfect example of, of the challenge that was faced in the space that we were in. Uh, Nate, who I just mentioned, this is probably back in 2016, he read to me this couple of paragraphs from his computer. And it just talked about a, a, a fitness business that cared about you, that coached you, that all these things that we do. And I'm like, Nate, when did you write that about us? I've never read it. He said, I didn't. I read that from Orange Theory's website. And I said, oh man, this is, this is a race to the bottom for us. It's like, we are, we are yelling with the littlest megaphone into this big, vast cavernous space that there's all these people with larger megaphones yelling with. And so what that meant, Thomas, was that in order for us to survive as a business, I knew I was going to get a very small proportion of the market share. So I needed to charge as much money as I could to be financially viable. So, you know, we were 100, $150 to $250 a month was, you know, was the cost. And I'm still in that same commercial fitness business today because we have not made this transition over to the medical fitness facility yet. And our average member pays us $250 a month. So just on an economic level, we, we weren't accessible. Like we're doing a great job of taking people that aren't even uh, mid socioeconomic status. These are, you know, high socioeconomic status people in a very affluent part of Ann Arbor who are already reasonably healthy and we're making them healthier. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, I grew up in a lower middle class community. My, you know, I'm here in Michigan. My dad was an auto worker. My mom worked for an automotive supplier. They worked their butts off. 
I didn't, the part I didn't tell you about that story back from high school is there was a guy, Al, who took me under his wing at that YMCA and was kind of my first coach and mentor, but he didn't charge any money for it. He just did it because he saw something in me. So financial accessibility has always been something that I've been very keen to. And, you know, maybe at some point later in the discussion, we can get into the medical fitness model, but the scale of the medical fitness model allows you to be much more accessible from a, a price point perspective. So there's the financial accessibility piece. And then there's just the general inclusivity that is lacking in the traditional fitness industry as a whole. Like I realized that if we were going to be just fitness, if I was going to be lumped into the category with the Orange Theories and the Planet Fitnesses of the world, not that there's anything wrong with those businesses, but they serve a very, very distinct market. It is the 15 to 20% of the American public that goes to gyms and fitness centers. And I realized just on its face, we weren't going to be inclusive enough if I was always going to be applied fitness solutions. I needed, just like I learned from the podcast where I needed the Michigan brand to bring trust and equity in the medical fitness model, you need the healthcare brand to build that trust and equity. So the, the brand shift that will be able to take place when we partner with this health system that we're partnering with will be such a shift in the local market and the consumer's minds, because now we are a healthcare entity, not a fitness entity. And that inherently is more inclusive. If you look at statistics, somebody's physician, their physician or their health system is the most trusted entity that they interact with. Ironically enough, health systems are not viewed as the most trusted entity, but you view your health system as the most trusted entity. So there's that little bit of a disconnect. So that's that's what I mean by that. There's, there's an economic level to the accessibility and there's just the general lack of inclusivity that has existed for so long in the fitness industry that I needed to be in fitness enough to do what I do well to help people, but not in fitness so much that I was going to lose equity and trust with the people I was trying to help the most. You know, so, you know, you're in Michigan, I'm in New York City, so so I'm kind of seeing what you're doing a little bit from a distance, okay. but everything you just said, it would seem to me that you're you're somehow masterfully um, combining all these things you're doing with the University of Michigan and the podcast um, and your own business savvy and experience, et cetera, to kind of tie all this up together and make it successful. And so my question to you is if, if, if I'm not even sure how to word the question, but um, can, can you tell our listeners or viewers how you're going about doing this? Because you're, you're also um, you know, presenting all the time. You're getting ready to present at the ACSM's, um, what is the health and fitness conference? And, yep. and you know, you're presenting all the time. So how are you like tying this all together and maybe even kind of lead at some point into some of the guests you've had on your podcast and, and how you're kind of tapping in to that as well. And, and also just kind of like what you're learning from it. By the way, most people looking for the services of a fitness professional are really just looking for information on how to get started on the right path, not to pay for training sessions every week for months or years on end. For the 60 to 70% of people with chronic disease and or joint pain, they're also looking for someone who can help them develop a clinically safe, individualized exercise program that takes their conditions into consideration. If you're interested in getting yourself or for clinicians, your patients started on a safe, cost-friendly medical fitness program, you can find more information about the virtual services we offer at mrfinstitute.org slash services. We staff only degree kinesiologists and exercise physiologists and will work with your healthcare providers in the design of your exercise program. For the clinicians listening in, you can add this virtual service as a reduced cost option for your patients. Check out our website and send us an email and we'll give you the details about this unique and much needed service. Yeah, that's a great question. And so I think you know you asked me for practical lessons, you know, before we we came on air. And I think I'm going to give everyone the lesson that I think is the most practical and most important life lesson you could ever learn, which is put infinitely more value into the world than you extract, and good things will happen. 
And so how, how did I partner with the University of Michigan? How have I been able to have conversations with the C-suites of all the major health systems in the state of Michigan? It didn't happen overnight. So I'll, I'll use University of Michigan as an example. I'm an alum. And, you know, as soon as I graduated, you know, with the little bit of money I had, I started to donate some money to the school just because I wanted to help out. And then when my business got successful enough, I started a scholarship with the school. Like I, we were actually putting $5,000 a year into a scholarship. And I mean, you guys know fitness businesses, you know, $5,000 know, isn't a lot of money, but for a, a fitness business, like the, we're not big tech, you know, we're not, we're not making millions of dollars a year. So I did that. And then Anytime the school had alumni they wanted to have speak or they asked for people on the alumni board, I was just always there to, to give of my time, to give of my talent, to give of the money I could. I never asked for anything in return. And in fact, the, the way I started teaching at Michigan, which is really my end to be able to use the, the brand for the podcast, is at one point, I wasn't happy with the direction the program was going, and I threatened to pull my scholarship money away. And I had a meeting with the dean, and you know, in that meeting, I think like the thought that came up in her mind was, "All right, dude, you you think all this stuff is wrong with our program or that we need to fix? You go fix some of it." So like, I had the opportunity to teach one class. They brought me in for an interview, and the panel of people I interviewed with were all people I knew, I had a relationship with. I had already had 10 to 12 years of a trusted business in the community. So they were hiring a knowing entity when they hired me. And then of course, there when I got my teaching position, I put in a lot more effort and energy than what I ever got out. You know, I mean, you guys, you know, have done some, you know, and Jeff, I know you're getting into teaching, you know, a little bit, you know, Thomas, I'm sure you've done it too. The adjunct faculty members are not paid well. That's so they could pay the tenure track faculty well. So I, 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 I gave, right. And that, that's how I was able to build the trust to get the brand. And, you know, with the, uh, with the, the medical fitness program that I, I'm, I'm doing with the, the local healthcare system. And now I'm talking in vague generalities right now. We have our healthcare partners solidified, but we are still finalizing the arrangement. And there's enough NDAs that are in place right now that I'm even afraid of saying healthcare partner, it, it might get me in trouble. <laughs> but, but so I sat on a board for the American Heart Association with the CEO of Trinity Health Ann Arbor and the COO of Michigan Medicine. We were on the same board. We were on a board for four years together for the American Heart Association. And when I wanted to talk to them about my venture, all I simply said was, hey guys, I'm doing this cool thing. Would you mind just having a chat with me? And they said, yes, because I already built this relationship with them. And then that allowed me to say to the other two major health systems in Michigan, hey, I'm talking to Trinity and I'm talking to Michigan Medicine do you guys want to talk? And of course, you know, no one wants to get left out in the cold. So uh, all of that to say is that it's been about building relationships, trust, equity, and then, you know, building value. And so, you know, to circle that around to the podcast, Jeff, you know, every guest I've had in the podcast, and this is no different, you know, than what I did with either of you, like, I want to put the spotlight on you. You know, I, I want it to be just like you guys are doing right now. You're, you're letting me talk. You're putting the spotlight on me. That causes you know me to enjoy the experience. So when I ask people to be on the podcast, you, I, Jeff, I want to know how we can promote the stuff that you're doing. And Thomas, I want to know how we can promote the stuff you're doing. So again, you, people give me their time for the podcast, but I try to give them a platform. And you know, I don't care if it's, you know, I've had Cedric Bryant from the American Council on Exercise to talk about an ACE program that they were doing that we highlighted. I've had uh, David Katz and a bunch of people from the ACLM on the podcast, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, to highlight things they're doing. Uh, Michelle Seeger to highlight, you know, a couple of books that she's done. Uh, Barry Franklin, who's a very well-known exercise physiologist, he wrote a book. I had him on to talk about that. So, you know, when I think about talking to a guest on the podcast, first, you know, like I said, I got to want to learn something from them. But secondly, I want to say, all right, what are you doing that we can talk about with our listeners and expose them to your great work in the, the narrow window of an episode? And so that's how I think I've been able to build a guest list. And, and like I said earlier, you know, you, you get a David Katz, you get a Cedric Bryant, you get a Jeff Young or a Thomas Hammett, 
And then people are like, yeah, I'll, I'll come on your podcast. Look at all these people you have. Exactly. exactly. And, and absolutely, whether it's with a podcast or with business or whatever, the hardest thing sometimes is to get that first one under your belt and maybe even the first two or three. But once you get the first two or three, then at that point, it becomes just so much easier. And another thing I want to say is um, I actually can really relate to some of the things that you said, how you got started, because when I first started in uh, a Mount Sinai system here in New York City, and then when we expanded and, 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 and took over another floor in this big, beautiful gym, I got on the uh, phone with Penn State. And uh -huh. that, that really started to move me forward. And I said, hey, uh, I don't know if you remember me. But I'm Jeff Young. I'm a 96 graduate, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and you know, I'm in this amazing facility in New York City now. I'd love to, uh, and I, I'm, I wouldn't be here, at least in part, if it wasn't for Penn State. I would love to be able to give back. And then, you know, very similar to a lot of things that you said, I just, I just wanted to give back for no other reason than to give back. And next thing you know, I'm on the board of directors for their kinesiology alumni program i'm guest lecturing and i'm realizing wait a second this is this is actually these are really, really good lines on my resume which is going to help my credibility to help launch things and, and things just kind of went from there so i can and, and then you build just like you were kind of alluding to um you then build a circle around you and it, and it's and then and then it just becomes about the networking and, and whatever you're going to do with the networking to move your career path in the in the direction you want to lead it yeah, but you said it. I mean, just like what I did, you didn't go to Penn State like, hey, I got this flashy job at this flashy hospital. You, you should pay me to do something with you. You said, right. hey, you helped me get here. I want to give back. And, yes. and you really had, you know, that altruistic motive of just wanting to help. And you know, both of you guys are like that. I mean, both of you have helped me out. You know, I I hope I help have helped you out on some level. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's everyone's kind of in this continual. If you're in a continual state of paying it forward, it it always works out well for you. I've never met anyone that is selfish and narrow minded that gets very far professionally because you got you got to stand on the shoulders of giants if you're going to be successful. I think that that's just you do that by saying, hey what's a pain point for you or what's some value I can add to your life? Here it is. And eventually it'll become an opportunity for that to come back to you. Yeah, absolutely. So it's also funny that we're saying this because my next guest next week is going to be Dr. Jessica Matthews, who I'm not sure if you know or not, but she's on the board of directors for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I got to know her through actually Cedric Bryant introduced me to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we were just having a conversation the other day and she said exactly what you just said, that it's, it's all about just paying it forward. And 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 if you do that, and if, and if, if that's your if that's your motive to try to try do things for the better good and for and in, in our case for public health, then things will come back uh, in a positive way for you. So, yeah. So we'll, uh, we're talking about that now, and I'll probably be talking about that again next week, or, or Thomas and I, uh, when we have Jessica on the show. Exactly right. Yeah, you can't you can't say it enough. You know, and look, we're also we're also in a business. You know, for anyone that's listening, in case they haven't figured it out yet, you're not going to become a zillionaire working in our business. That's that's not that when I teach my students at U of M that my freshmen, I say, hey, if anyone's make, looking to make millions of dollars, you should stand up right now and walk down towards the Ross School of Business. They'll, they'll <laughs> teach you how to make zillions of dollars. You know, you could have a, a, a very, very meaningful career doing great work, making good money doing what we're doing, but it has to be because you want the greater good of society to advance and you want public health to advance. It's not because you want, you know, a couple more zeros on your paycheck, because that's just not the nature of the thing we do. Exactly. All right. So, you know, from here, there's, there's in the time we have left, which is maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes, um, there's all kinds of directions we could take this. And I'd rather, honestly, Mike, just kind of let you um, lead it, because you could talk about, uh, if you want more about your podcast and some of the guests you've had on and, and conversations and maybe some of the more memorable ones or um, some practical takeaways from that. Maybe, you know, you're, you're on the board of directors for the Physical Activity Alliance. And so you've got some serious background uh, insight as to what's going on with trying, you know, this movement to connect medicine and fitness uh, that would be great for viewers, both clinicians and um, fitness professionals to be aware of. Um, and then also again, your business savvy and the and the things you're doing right now with with building your your business. So 
first of all, this is definitely not going to be a one-off. You're definitely going to uh, come back. So whatever we don't cover today, we'll cover in few future episodes. But however you want to take this and and uh, whatever you feel is most important today, I would love to just um, listen to what you have to say. Yeah. So, you know, I think what I think in terms of what I, I tend to be most passionate about talking about, it's, you know, how, what are some very, very practical and tangible things that we can do to advance the credibility, you know, of our profession? And so I think that's a good broad umbrella for us to talk under. I wrote a, an industry, a, a, a article and, you know, I'll send it to you guys if you want to put it on your show notes page um, for club industry. And the article was the five steps to professionalize the fitness industry. And I talked about a lot of things that I, I saw as important for our industry. And it was very, it was pretty well received. And I was actually very impressed that club industry was so willing to uh, print the whole article because it wasn't a, a glowing review of all the things we were, were doing right. I mean, it was a, it was a, Hey, we, we got to get better. And so I, I think that that provides some good context to kind of round out this discussion. And it also is going to allow me to pull in some of the things that are happening with the Physical Activity Alliance and the U.S. Registry of Exercise Professionals. And so, you know, kind of the first thing that, that I said in that article is that, you know, broadly speaking, and we touched on this earlier, we don't have trust as an industry. Certainly the commercial fitness industry lacks trust. We lack trust with the general public. We lack trust with politicians and medical professionals and public health professionals. So there's there's a lack of trust. And I think we have to acknowledge where that lack of trust comes from. And it's us, like broadly as an industry, like we have created that lack of trust. Yes. And it, it, it's our our imagery and our messaging that has just been very skewed towards uh, something I said earlier, getting the fit fitter. You know, we've, we've focused very much as an industry on body composition as an outcome primarily. Our messaging has been around that. Our imagery, if you look at, if you just Google stock images for fitness, you're going to find in shape, mid twenties to mid thirties, white people. Like that's the stock image that exists out there for, you know, fitness. And those aren't the people who need our help the most, who we're going to serve the most. So I think, you know, part of professionalizing our industry, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here with you guys and probably your listeners, but we have to be very conscious of the imagery and the messaging that we're using. You know, how do we shift away from the body composition centric messaging that's existed for decades in our industry and shift it more towards the physical and the mental health outcomes. I do think that's starting to happen, but I think it needs to happen on a, on a broader basis because the status quo, you know, isn't working. I think, you know, take that a step further. You know, if you want to start to professionalize the industry, and this is a lot of the great work that the U S registry of exercise professionals is doing right now, you actually need to follow the pathway that physical therapists and athletic trainers have laid out before us. Like if you think of PTs and athletic trainers, they've put in place a system that has allowed them to become part of the healthcare continuum. And how have they done it? Well, the first thing they've done is they've uniformed education curriculums across the country. And this is one thing that we don't have, and I know both of you know this, if you go to Penn State Exercise Science, University of Michigan Exercise Science, if you go to you know Washington Exercise Science, those are three distinct academic curriculum for exercise science. We learn some of the same stuff, but a lot of stuff we learn is different. Can you imagine for a second if nursing curriculums were different across the country? I mean, a doctor wouldn't trust a nurse. So we have to uniform the academic curriculums. We need some sort of uniformed credentialing exam. Now, I don't know who does that. Uh, you know, I know ACSM would seem like a logical candidate, but you know, I'm not, I don't really have a horse in the race as to who our board examiner would be, but mm -hmm. there is a nursing board. You know, Thomas, you're a PT. You took a board examination. I'm not saying we need licensure. In fact, I don't think licensure is the answer per se. I think that's you know overly regulatory and, and paternalistic. But I do think we need an exam that says, "Hey, you meet certain standards," and it's consistent because you know we all know you know Jeff, you're CSCS. You know I've got my CSCS, but I also got my ACSMEP, which you may or may not have. 
but alphabet soup doesn't matter to the general consumer because there's so many different things. So we need that uniform criteria around that the credential or the board exam. And then the US registry is a great example. That is the database for professionals that are current on their certifications and it's certifications that are deemed as reputable, but nobody knows that that thing even exists, right? Like, I mean, some people are, have no idea. So, you know, employers need to be using that. So we have to yeah. hire professionals that meet a certain standard. And that's both on the professionals, but also on the industry and academia to put the right infrastructure in place. Um, and then I feel like I'm just like, I could go and then, and then, and then for a while on this, <laughs> you know, what once, once we've actually done that and we've put qualified people in place, you know, uh, people like you, Jeff, you, Thomas, you know, me, when I was on the work off floor, people that can produce outcomes, we need to get really good at collecting that data and reporting those outcomes back to health professionals. So they actually see the difference we're making in their patients. There needs to be that communication mechanism that exists but we need to be able to produce those outcomes first. And, you know, I always talk about outcomes in our industry. And I think your, your average personal trainer that just has their, you know, weekend workshop certification that isn't educated, you probably is not producing really good outcomes. So they don't want to measure the thing that they're not doing really well. So we got to up the standard of practice. We have to produce the outcomes. And then we have to tell it from the mountaintops, however we can, what those outcomes are hopefully reporting it back to our clients, physicians. And then I think we can get the medical community to start to, to see what we're doing. Like, oh, wait a second. You, know, you took this VO, person's VO2 max, their grip strength, their overhead squat. Look at all these things you did. Oh, wow. Now look at their, their CBC and look at you know, these other measures that I'm taking clinically, their blood pressure. Wow, those are improving too. So you, know, you take fitness outcome metrics do you tie it to health outcome metrics and then and this doesn't exist yet but like this is the challenge for everyone that's listening so please you know feel free to take this challenge up you take fitness outcome data tie it to health outcome data and then you tie it to claims data right like if you could tie it to the payer mechanism and people can actually associate a dollar value earned or saved from the things we're doing upstream then by following the money, you actually make us more part of what's happening clinically. So, you know, I, I think those are, you know, some of the critical things that I like to talk about. We need the right imagery and messaging. We need the right professionals educated in the appropriate way. And then we need to actualize that education in a way that produces outcomes. And we need to be very good at telling the story around those outcomes. Um, and then the last thing I'll add before, before we kind of close the loop on this, is if we are not measuring physical activity status clinically on a consistent basis, we're never going to get to the point where we're going to intervene and do something about it. And this is where the Physical Activity Alliance is doing some amazing work around physical activity vital sign. Uh, currently, right now, the Physical Activity Alliance is really on the verge by, of, by working with Health and Human Services, CDC, and the Office of the National Coordinator for Interoperability of, of Health Records, which is a, a mouthful, basically getting physical activity to be a required standardized vital sign in all EHR systems around the country, which means that once we can measure it, then we could see first what's going on, because I don't think we know the totality of the inactivity crisis in this country. And then once we know that someone's not meeting the standard, we could put an intervention in place. You can't prescribe a hypertensive medication until you've taken somebody's blood pressure and seen they're hypertensive. So it's the same thing with measuring physical activity. Now, the good thing of all that is it's all underway. Like these things are happening, but the reason I wanted to talk about them is like, and I think this is the reason for your podcast, you want to amplify this as much as possible because some of this great work is happening behind the scenes and yes. people just don't know about it, but they need to know about it so they can get into the conversation and, and amplify the message even louder. You nailed it and I'm and I'm you killed it. I'm getting ready to pass this over to Thomas in a second because I he's got I'm sure he has 
plenty of things to say on this, but, the, but I want to chime in first and say that, man, do I really appreciate everything you just said. And I really do want the listener to know this um, because I know Thomas and I've gotten to know him well over the last two plus years. I know that he has his finger on the pulse of this stuff. And we actually uh, just presented on um, some of the things that you mentioned at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's annual conference back in November. Um, so Thomas, you know, being a, a clinician and knowing what I know that you do with uh, at the Pinnacle in Seattle, I would love to hear uh, what you have to say about what, what Mike just talked about. Yeah, you know, I mean, first off, what for anyone that was listening to that, like just as Jeff and I were, we were sitting here shaking our head over and over again, like, yeah, Mike, what you're saying is common sense, man. I think that was like a 20 minute stream of consciousness of just like, it is, it's, it's the truth. And what's hard though, as we're sitting here shaking our heads, is like, can you believe that that's not the status quo already? Right. In a world where there's so much data and so much information in pretty much everywhere else around us, mm -hmm. that one, medicine hasn't gotten its act together to measure basic preventive behavior like physical activity. Um, and that we just haven't brought fitness professionals into the fold in a way that allows us to, um, to understand. You know, I think all of us would sit here and shake our heads and say, of course, exercise is medicine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, the proof of what that actually looks like in practice in a standardized way anywhere across the United States, across the world, you couldn't define it really. Um, and it's a shame. And I think, you know, Mike, what, what you have your finger on the pulse of and what Jeff is mentioning about what we're doing is that there are people starting to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really excited. And, you know, I think that uh, once you get this business venture up and moving and you start to generate some of that data, um, that you're talking about, we'll have to have you back and see uh, see how we're doing on that. What I can tell you from my practice is that it's been tremendously difficult to start to coordinate um, data that comes from the health system and um, and data that comes from outside the health system and try to make meaning of it together. But we're getting there, and it's a really exciting time for me to think about moving um, really the opportunities that exist um, within medicine for people uh, in in a fitness field. Um, so yeah, I, I just couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And again, it just seems like such common sense, doesn't it? It does. But you know, here's the thing, like you said it, people are starting to think this way, talk this way. I mean, you know, I hope at some point, you know, you have a chance to talk about the work that you guys are doing out at Pinnacle, because I've actually been able to fly out there and see it firsthand and, and go through the software that you guys have de developed, which I mean, it's an amazing system, but you know, this is not going to be easy, right? Like, I think that that's, that's the thing. Like, medicine in America is so complex. It's so convoluted. It's so unique to any other place on, on the planet with the way it's structured. I mean, you go to our, our neighbor in, in the North, you know, Canada, it's a completely different story there. Right. Um, you go over to England, completely different story. So again, uh, that's a conversation for another time, but like here in America, because of the fragmented nature of healthcare, public, private, you know, payers, you know, profit, for-profit, non-profit. It's just so complicated mm -hmm. that it's not going to be easy, but because it's necessary and we all believe in it so strongly, we have to be willing to all forge this path. I mean, you know, you're doing something in New York, Jeff, I'm doing something in Michigan, Thomas, you're doing something in Seattle, but we need, you know, Jeff's, Thomas's and Mike's all over the country doing the same thing, saying the same thing and, and not shutting up about it until real change happens. So like ultimately, you know, mm -hmm. we need advocates. I mean, that's, you know, we are advocates for you know, medical fitness and what this, you know, means in the greater scheme of healthcare. But we, we need a lot more advocates because at, right now the, the bottom up grassroots efforts are really what's making the difference. The stuff that, you know, we're doing on the little micro level, because the policy level things, the things the Physical Activity Alliance are working on, and and groups like them, uh, they're just slow to move. So if we're gonna if we're gonna shift the landscape of healthcare, it's gonna have to come from you know that bottom up grassroots advocacy work that we're doing. Yeah. Well, and you just you know you said this word a number of times today, the word trust, and even kind of talking about the um, the essence of transparency, showing our outcomes in a way. Um, for better or for worse at times, uh, to help people understand the power of what it is that we do. And the more we hide from the unknown effects of what it is that we do or um, the data that we don't want to look at, 
Um, and the less that we say about what we do, which we all believe so strongly and know how powerful exercise and fitness is, um, the better we're all going to be for it. And, you know, I have to say, Mike, on you know, behalf of both of us and anyone who represents fitness professionals in the United States, we're lucky to have you as an advocate, man. Um, really, truly lucky to have someone who promotes the positive message that you do on, um, on a weekly basis on your podcast and out in, in all the things you do. So thanks for your work. Yeah, I appreciate it. Likewise, likewise to you guys. I, I absolutely second that with a, a zillion exclamation points. It's really been cool to see your, what I, it seems to me, an explosion in the time I've gotten to know you and uh, and all that you're doing. And just like Thomas said, uh, couldn't appreciate it more. Um, yeah, thank you, guys. That, I, I appreciate, yeah. the, appreciate the conversation. Yeah. So, you know, you're definitely going to be a return guest and, and, um, this has been really great uh, above and beyond the call of duty. I enjoyed, enjoyed this immensely. Um, do you have any parting thoughts or words, either one of you um, before we wrap this up? Uh, all right, Thomas, I'll go, I'll, I'll go first because I'm sure you have some parting thoughts. I, I you know, I, I think my biggest, you know, parting thought is, is what I said earlier, that if you're looking to make an impact in our, in our industry or just life in general, Figure out a way to add infinitely more value to the world than what you extract. Don't expect money from it right off the bat. Don't make it a transactional relationship. Give your time, your talents, your effort, your energy. And I promise you, if you do that, great things will come your way. So I, I think that's the biggest thing I'd like to leave your listeners with. If they do that, if they filter things through that lens, they can't go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, hey, it's been awesome. And uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it. We'll be talking again. And until then, hope you have a great rest of your week and weekend. I hope you enjoyed listening to all the nuggets that were coming from Mike as much as I did. Please go to mrfinstitute.org and our YouTube channel at the Medical Fitness Podcast for information on how to learn more about Mike, who he's collaborating with, a link to his own podcast series, and how to follow him on social media. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode.